Oki, my son, you must preserve these books with body and soul. They contain the history of all our people, as well as our forefathers. Last year I saved them in the flood, as well as you and your mother, but they got wet and therefore began to perish. In order not to lose them, I copied them on foreign paper. In case you inherit them, you must copy them likewise, and your children must do so too, so that they may never be lost. Written at Luwart in the 3,449th year after Atland was submerged, that is, according to the Christian reckoning that the year 1256 Hido surnamed over Delinda Watch. Beloved successors, for the sake of our dear forefathers and our dear liberty, I entreat you to a thousand times never let the eye of the monk look on these writings. They are very insinuating, and we do not shew ourselves strong to resist. They will altogether exterminate us. By Lico over Delinda, written at Ludvert, Anno Domini, eight o three, and it just goes through uh, all the characters in the book here, basically all the you know the people in the book. So it's a bit hard to read because it is all uh, like Dutch Frisian the name so uh, I'll leave the text uh, sorry the link in the description so you can uh, have a look at it yourself and getting back into it down here it says Fope Dunru's husband Greverton over the seven islands he was five times sea king the town Walhagen is under his care this was inscribed upon the walls of Friarsburg in Texland as well as at Stavia and Medesblick it was Friar's Day and seven times seven years had elapsed since Festa was appointed Volksmoder by the desire of Friar. The citadel of Medisblick was ready and Bergmard was chosen. Festa was about to light her new lamp and when she had done so in the presence of all the people, Friar called from her watch star so that everyone could hear it. Festa, take your style and write the things that I may not speak. Festa did as she was bid, and thus we became Friar's children, and our earliest history began. This is our earliest history. Werolda, who alone is eternal and good, made the beginning. Then commenced time, time wrought of all things, even the earth. The earth bore grass, herbs and trees, all that is good and useful she brought forth day by day, and all that is bad and, in, and injurious by night. After the twelfth jewel fest, she brought forth three maidens, Leda out of fierce heat, Finder out of strong heat, and Friar out of moderate heat. When the last came into existence, Warolda breathed his spirit upon her in order that men might be bound to him. As soon as they were full grown, they took pleasure and delight in the visions of Warolda. Hatred found its way among them. They each bore twelve sons and twelve daughters, at every jewel time a couple. Thence come all mankind. Leda was black with hair curled like a lamb's, her eyes shone like stars and shot out glances like those of a bird of prey. Leda was acute. She could hear a snake glide and could smell a fish in the water. Leda was strong and nimble. She could bend a large tree, yet when she walked she did not bruise a flower stalk. Leda was violent. Her voice was loud and when she screamed in anger, every creature quailed. Wonderful leader, she had no regard for the laws, her actions were governed by her passions. To help the weak, she would kill the strong, and when she had done it, she would weep by their bodies. Poor leader, she turned grey by her mad behaviour, and at least she died broken-hearted by the wickedness of her children. Foolish children, they accused each other of their mother's death, 
They howled and fought like wolves, and while they did this, the birds devoured the corpse. Who can refrain from tears at such a recital? Finda was yellow, and her hair was like the mane of a horse. She could not bend a tree, but when Lida killed one lion, she killed ten. Finda was seductive, her voice was sweeter than any birds, her eyes were alluring and enticing, but whoever looked upon them became her slave. Finda was unreasonable. She wrote thousands of laws, but she never obeyed one. She despised the frankness of the good and gave herself up to flatterers. That was her misfortune. Her head was too full, but her heart was too vain. She loved nobody but herself, and she wished that all should love her. False Finder. Honey sweet were her words, but those who trusted them found sorrow at hand. Selfish Finder. She wished to rule everybody, and her sons were like her. They made their sisters serve them, and they slew each other for the mastery. Treacherous Finder. One wrong word would irritate her, and the cruelest deeds did not affect her. If she saw a lizard swallow a spider, she shuddered. But if she saw her children kill a Frisian, her bosom swelled with pleasure. Unfortunate Finder. She died in the bloom of her age, and the mode of her death is unknown. Hypocritical Children. Her corpse was buried under a costly stone, pompous inscriptions were written upon it, and loud lamentations were heard at it, but in private not a tear was shed. Despicable people, the laws that Finder established were written on golden tables, and the object for which they were made was never attained. The good laws were abolished and the selfishness instituted, bad ones in their place. O Finder, then the earth overflowed with blood, and your children were moved down like grass. Yes, Finder, those were the fruits of your vanity. Look down from your watch star and weep. Friar was white, like the snow at sunrise, and the blue of her eyes vied with the rainbow. Beautiful Friar, like the rays of the sun shone the locks of her hair, which were as fine as spiders' webs. Clever Friar, when she opened her lips, the birds ceased to sing and the leaves to quiver. Powerful Friar, at the glance of her eye, the lion sat down at her feet and the adder withheld his poison. Pure Friar, her food was honey and her beverage was dew gathered from the cups of the flowers. Sensible Friar, the first lesson that she taught her children was self-control and the second was the love of virtue. And when they were grown, she taught them the value of liberty. For she said, without liberty, all other virtues serve to make you slaves and to disgrace your origin. Generous Friar. She never allowed metal to be dug from the earth for her own benefit, but when she did it, it was for the general use. Most happy Friar. Like the starry host in the firmament, her children clustered around her. Wise Friar, when she had seen her children reach the seventh generation, she summoned them all to the fly land, and there gave them her text, saying, Let this be your guide, and it can never go ill with you. Exalted Friar, when she had thus spoken, the earth shook like the sea of Waralda, the ground of flyland sank beneath her feet. The air was dim by tears, and when they looked for their mother, she was already risen to her watching star. Then at length, thunder burst from the clouds, and the lightning wrote upon the firmament, Watch, far-seeing friar. The land from which she had risen was now a stream, and except her, Tex, all that was in it, was overwhelmed. Obedient children, when they came to themselves again, they made this high mound and built this citadel upon it, and on the walls they wrote the text, and that everyone should be able to find it, they called the land about it text land. Therefore, it shall remain as long as the earth shall be the earth. Friars' Texts 
prosperity awaits the free. At last they shall see me again, though him only can I recognize as free, who is neither a slave to another nor to himself. This is my counsel. 1. When in dire distress and when mental and physical energy avail nothing, then have recourse to the spirit of Rerolda. Do not appeal to him before you have tried all other means. For I tell you beforehand, and time will prove it is true, that those who give way to discouragement sink under their burdens. 2. To a rolder's spirit only shall you bend the knee in gratitude thrice fold for what you have received, for what you do receive, and for the hope of aid in the, your time of need. Number three, you have seen how speedily I have come to your assistance. Do likewise to your neighbour, but wait not for his entreaties. The suffering would curse you, my maidens, would erase your name from the book, and I would, would regard you as a stranger. Number four, let not your neighbour express his thanks to you on bended knee, which is only due to, to Rerolda's spirit. Envy would assail you, wisdom would ridicule you, and my maidens would accuse you of irreverence. Number five, for things are given for your enjoyment, air, water, land and fire, but Rerolda is the sole possessor of them. Therefore, my counsel to you is choose upright men who will fairly divide the labor and the fruits so that no man shall be exempt from work or from the duty of defense. Number six, if ever it should happen that one of your people should sell his freedom, he is not of you. He is a bastard. I counsel you to expel him and his mother from the land. Repeat this to your children morning, noon and night till they think of it in their dreams. Number seven, if any man shall deprive another, even his debtor, of his liberty, let him be to you as a vile slave, and I advise you to burn his body and that of his mother in an open place and bury them fifty feet below the ground, so that no grass shall grow upon them. It would be poison to your cattle. Meddle not with the people of Leda, nor of Finda, because Weralda would help them and any injury that you inflicted on them would recoil upon your own heads. 9. If it should happen that they come to you for advice or assistance, then it behoves you to help them. But if they should rob you, then fall upon them with fire and sword. 10. If any of them should seek a daughter of yours to wife and she is willing, Explain to her her folly, but if she will follow her lover, let it go in peace. 11. If your son wishes for a daughter of theirs to do the same as to your daughter, but let not either one or the other ever return among you, for they would introduce foreign morals and customs, and if these were accepted by you, I could no longer watch over you. 12. Upon my servant faster, I have placed all my hopes. Therefore you must choose her for ever morida. Follow my advice, then she will hereafter remain my servant, as well as all the sacred maidens who succeed her. Then shall the lamp which I have lighted for you never be extinguished. Its brightness shall always illuminate your intellect and you shall always remain as free from foreign domination as your fresh river water is distinct from the sea salt. And you shall always remain as free from foreign... And you shall always remain as free from foreign domination as your fresh river water is distinct from the salt sea.
This has faster spoken. All the regulations which have existed a century, that is a hundred years, may be all the regulations which have existed a century, that is a hundred years, may by advice of the Eremoda, with the consent of the community, be inscribed upon the walls of the citadel. And when inscribed on the walls, they become laws. And it is only duty. And it is our duty to respect them all. If by force or necessity any regulations should be imposed upon us at variance with our laws and customs, we must submit. But should we be released, we must always return to our own again. That is Friar's will, and must that be of all her children. Anything that any man commences, whatever it may be, on the day appointed by Friar's worship, shall eternally fail. For time has proven that she was right, and it is become a law that no man shall, except for the absolute necessity, keep that day otherwise than a joyful feast. These are the laws established for the government of the citadels. Whenever a citadel is built, the lamp belonging to it must be lighted at the original lamp in Texland, and that can only be done by the mother. Every mother shall appoint her own maidens. She may even choose those who are mothers in other towns. The mother of Texland may appoint her own successor, but should she die without having done so, the election shall take place at a general assembly of the whole nation. The mother of Texland may have 21 maidens and seven assistants, so that there may always be seven to attend the lamp day and night. She may have the same number of maidens who are mothers in other towns. If a maiden wishes to marry, she must announce it to the mother and immediately resign her office before her passion shall have polluted the light. For the service of the mother and of each of the burgged maidens, there shall be appointed 21 townsmen, 21 townsmen, seven civilians of mature years, seven warriors of mature years, and seven seamen of mature years. Out of the seven, three shall retire every year and shall not be replaced by members of their own family nearer than the fourth degree. Each may have 300 young townsmen as defenders. For this service they must study Friar's texts and laws. From the sages they must learn wisdom, from the warriors the art of war, and from the sea kings the skill required for distant voyages. Every year 100 of the defenders shall return to their homes, and those that may have been wounded shall remain in the citadels. At the election of the defenders, no burger or grevt man or other persons of distinction shall vote, but only the people. The mother of Texland shall have three times seven active messengers and three times twelve speedy horses. In the other citadels, each maiden shall have three messages and seven horses. Every citadel shall have 50 agriculturalists chosen by the people, but only those may be chosen who are not strong enough to go to war or go to sea. Every citadel must provide for its own sustenance and must maintain its own defences and look after its share of the general contributions. If a man is chosen to fill any office and refuses to serve, he can never become a burger, nor have any vote, and if he is already a burger, he shall cease to be so. If any man wishes to consult the mother or a burg maiden, he must apply to the secretary who will take him to the burg's master. He will then be examined by surgeons to see if he is in good health. If he passes, he shall lay aside his arms and seven warriors shall present him to the mother. 
If the affair concerns only one district, he must bring forward not less than three witnesses, but if it affects the whole, free, the whole of Friesland, he must have 21 additional witnesses in order to guard against any deceptions. Under all circumstances, the mother must take care that her children, that is, Friar's people, shall remain as temperate as possible. This is her most important duty, and it is the duty of all of us to help her in performing it. If she is called upon to decide any judicial questions between the grieved man and the community, she must incline towards the side of the community in order to maintain peace, and because it is better that one man should suffer than many. If anyone comes to the mother for advice and she is prepared to give it, she must do it immediately. If she does not know what to advise, he must remain waiting for seven days, and if then she is unable to advise, he must go away without complaining, for it is better to have no advice at all than bad advice. If a mother shall have given bad advice out of ill will, she must be killed or driven out of the land, deprived of everything. If her Berkthiren are accomplices, they are too to be treated in a similar manner. If her guilt is doubtful or only suspected, it must be considered and debated, if necessary, for 21 weeks. If half the votes are against her, she must be declared innocent. If two-thirds are against her, she must wait a whole year. If the votes are then the same, she must be considered guilty, but they may not be put to death. And if any of the one-third who have voted for her wish to go away with her, they may depart with all their live and dead stock, and shall not be less considered, since the majority may be wrong as well as the minority. The Book of Adela's Followers Thirty years to the day on which the Volksmotor was murdered by the Commander Magi was a time of great distress. All the states that all the states that lie on the other side of the Wesser had been wrested from us and had fallen under the power of Magi, and it looked as if his power was to become supreme over the whole land. To avert this misfortune, a general assembly of the people was summoned, which was attended by all the men who stood in good repute with the Magden, or the priestesses. Then, at the end of three days, the whole council was in confusion, and in the same position as when they came together. Thereupon Adela demanded to be heard and said, You all know that I was three years bergmagd. You know also that I was chosen for Volksmoda and that I refused to be Volksmoda because I wished to marry a Pole. But what you do not know is that I have watched everything that has happened as if I have really been your Volksmoda. I have constantly travelled about observing what was going on. By that means I have become acquainted with many things that others do not know. You said yesterday that our relatives on the other side of the Wesser were all dull and cowardly, but I may tell you that the Magi has not won a single village from them by force of arms, but only by detestable deceit, and still more by the rapacity of their dukes and nobles. Friar has said we must not admit amongst us any but free people, but what have they done? They have imitated our enemies, and instead of killing their prisoners or letting them go free, they have de despised the counsel of the Friar and have made slaves of them. Because they have acted thus, Friar cared no longer to watch over them. They robbed others of their freedom and therefore lost their own. This is well known to you, but I will tell you how they came to sink so low. The Finn women had children. These grew up with our free children. They played and gambled together in the fields and were also together by the hearth. There they learned with pleasure the loose ways of the Finns, because they were bad and new, and thus they became denationalized in spite of the efforts of their parents. 
When the children grew up and saw that, that the children of the Finns handled no weapons and scarcely worked, they took a distaste for work and became proud. The principal men and their cleverest sons made up the wanton daughters of the Finns, and their own daughters, led astray by this bad example, allowed themselves to be beguiled by the handsome young Finns in derision of their depraved fathers. When the Magi found when the Magi found this out, he took to the handsomest of the Finns and Magiars and promised them red cows with golden horns to let themselves be taken prisoners by our people in order to spread his doctrines. His people did even more. Children disappeared, were taken away from the uplands, and after they had been brought up in his pernicious doctrines, were sent back. When these pretended... When these pretended prisoners had learned our language, they persuaded the dukes and nobles that they should become subject to the Magi, that then their sons would succeed to them without having to be elected, those who by their good deeds had gained a piece of land in front of their house. They promised on their side should receive, in addition, a piece behind. Those who had got a piece before and behind should have a round deal or a complete circuit and those who had the round deal should have a whole freehold. If the, if the seniors were true to the friar, then they changed their course and turned to the degenerate sons. Yesterday there were among you those who would have called the whole people together to compel the eastern states to return to their duties. According to my humble opinion, they would have made a great mistake Suppose that there were a very serious epidemic among the cattle. Would you run the risk of sending your own healthy cattle among the sick ones? Certainly not. Everyone must see that doing that would turn out to be very bad for the whole of the cattle. Who then would, so imp would be so imprudent as to send their children among a people that were wholly depraved? If I were to give you any advice, it would be to choose a new Volksmoder. I know that you are in difficulty about it because out of the 13 Bugmarkten that we still have remaining, eight are candidates for the dignity, but I should pay no attention to that. Chunxia, the Bergmark of Medasklik, who is not a candidate, is a person of knowledge and sound sense and quite as attached to our people as the customs as the rest together. I should farther recommend that you should visit all the citadels and write down all the laws of the friars' text, as well as the histories and all that is written on the walls in order that it may not be destroyed with the citadels. It stands written that every Volksmoder and every Bergmarkt shall have assistants and messengers, 21 maidens and 7 apprentices, if I might add more, I would recommend that all the respectable girls in the town should be taught, for I say positively, and time will show it, that if you wish to remain true children of the friar, never to be vanquished by fraud or arms, you must take care to bring up your daughters as true friar's daughters. You must teach the children how great our country has been, what great men our forefathers were, how great we still are, if we compare ourselves to others. You must tell them of the sea heroes, of their mighty deeds and distant voyages. All these stories must be told by the fireside and in the field, wherever it may be, in times of joy or times of sorrow. And if you wish to impress it upon the brains and the hearts of your sons, you must let it flow through the lips of your wives and your daughters. Adela's advice was followed. This was inscribed upon the walls of Friarsburg in Texland, as well as at Stavia and Medelsblick. It was Friars' Day and seven times seven years had elapsed since Festa was appointed Volksmoder by the desire of Friar. The citadel of Medelsblick was ready and Bergmard was chosen. Festa was about to light her new lamp, and when she had done so, Friar called from her watch star so that everyone could hear it. 
Fester, take your style and write the things that I may not speak. Fester did as she was bid, and thus we became Friar's children, and our earliest histories began. This is our earliest history. Waralda, who alone is eternal and good, made the beginning. Then commenced time. Time wrought all things, even the earth. The earth bore grass, herbs and trees, all useful and all noxious animals. All that is good and useful she brought forth by day, and all that is bad and injurious by night. After the twelfth jewel fest she brought forth three maidens. Leda out of fierce heat, Finda out of strong heat, and Friar out of moderate heat. When the last came into existence, Warolda breathed his spirit upon her in order that men might be bound to him. As soon as they were full grown, they took pleasures and delight in the visions of Warolda. Hatred found its way in among them. They each bore twelve sons and twelve daughters, at every jewel time a couple. Thence come all mankind. Leda was black with hair curled like a lamb's, her eyes shone like stars and shot out glances like those of a bird of prey. Leda was acute. She could hear a snake glide and could smell a fish in the water. Leda was strong and nimble. She could bend a large tree, yet when she walked, she did not bruise a flower stalk. Leda was violent. Her voice was loud and when she screamed in anger, every creature quailed. Wonderful leader, she had no regard for laws. Her actions were governed by her passions. To help the weak, she would kill the strong, and when she had done it, she would weep by their bodies. Poor leader, she turned grey by her mad behaviour, and at last she died heartbroken by the wickedness of her children. Foolish children, they accused each other of their mother's death. They howled and fought like wolves. And while they did this, the birds devoured the corpse. Who can retain from tears at such a recital? Finda was yellow, and her hair was like the mane of a horse. She could not bend a tree, but where Lita killed one lion, she killed ten. Finda was seductive. Her voice was sweeter than any bird's. Her eyes were alluring and enticing, but whoever looked upon them became her slave. Finda was unreasonable. She wrote thousands of laws, but she never obeyed one. She despised the frankness of the good and gave herself up to flatterers. That was her misfortune. Her head was too full, but her heart was too vain. She loved nobody but herself, and she wished that all should love her. False Finda. Honey sweet were her words, but those who trusted them found sorrow at hand. Selfish Finda. She wished to rule everybody, and her sons were like her. They made, they made their sisters serve them, and they slew each other for the mastery. Treacherous Finder. One wrong word would irritate her, and the cruelest deeds did not affect her. If she saw a lizard swallow a spider, she'd shudder. But if she saw her children kill a Frisian, her bosom swelled with pleasure. Unfortunate Finder. She died in the bloom of her age, and the mode of her death is unknown. Hypocritical children, her corpse was buried under a costly stone. Pompous inscriptions were written on it, and loud lamentations were heard at it. But in private, not a tear was shed. Despicable people, the laws that Finder established were written on golden tables, but the object for which they were made was never attained. The good laws were abolished, and selfishness instituted bad ones in their place. O Fender, then the earth overflowed with blood, and your children were mown down like grass. Yes, Fender, those were the fruits of your vanity. Look down from your watch star and weep. Friar was white like the snow at sunrise, and the blue of her eyes vied with the rainbow. Beautiful Friar! Like the rays of the sun shone the locks of her hair, which were as fine as spiders' webs. Clever friar, when she opened her lips, the birds ceased to sing and leaves to quiver.
powerful friar. At the glance of her, the lion lay down at her feet, and the adder withheld his poison. Pure friar. Her food was honey, and her beverage was dew gathered from the cups of the flowers. Sensible friar. The first lesson that she taught her children was self-control, and the second was the love of virtue. And when they were grown, she taught them the value of liberty. For she said, Without liberty, all other virtues serve to make you slaves and to disgrace your origin. Generous friar. She never allowed metal to be dug from the earth for her own benefit, but when she did it, it was for the general use. Most happy friar. Like the starry host in the firmament, her children clustered around her. Wise friar. When she had seen her children reach their seventh generation, she summoned them all to flyland, and there gave them her text, saying, Let this be your guide, and it can never go ill with you. Exalted friar. When she had thus spoken, the earth shook like the sea. The Baralda, the ground of flyland, sunk beneath her feet. The air was dimmed by tears, and when they looked for their mother, she was already risen to her watching star. Then at length, thunder burst from the clouds, and the lightning wrote up the firmament. Watch. Far-seeing friar. The land from which she had risen was now a stream, and except her text, all that was in it was overwhelmed. Obedient children, when they came to themselves again, they made this high mound and built this citadel upon it, and on the walls they wrote the text, and that everyone should be able to find it, they called the land about it text land. Therefore it shall remain as long as the earth shall be the earth.